Dr. Sarah Willie LeBreton, an authority on African American culture, politics, and literature. Willie LeBreton is the author of Acting Black, College Identity and the Performance of Race, a study of college educated African Americans in post civil rights movement era. Informed by her teaching and her work with community groups, Willie LeBreton teaches courses on African American culture and politics, and her research explores minority and majority and subordinate and su su subordinate su relations. Can't talk today. The construction of her knowledge and the subversion of oppression. An exchange student at Spelman College in 1984, Willie LeBreton graduated from Haverford College in 1986 and received her PhD from Northwestern University in 1995. And we are really excited to hear her come and talk today. She's also been featured on CNN, correct, and CNN, and various other places. So we're really excited. She is the associate professor at Swarthmore College. Anybody familiar with Swarthmore? All right. She's the, she's the department head of the sociology Depart department and the black studies department as well. So let's give her a warm welcome. I'm a little self-conscious with this microphone. Is it too loud? Fine. Okay. <laughs> so thank you for introducing me and for the invitation to be here. I'm especially grateful to Shin Sing Pai and Yolanda Evans for who have made my visit possible. So I'm going to read, but I'm going to try to depart from it and ask you some questions about Penn State Altoona, and you can tell me a little bit more about this campus when I'm finished. I'm going to talk about the research for this book that I've written called Acting Black. It's about African Americans on college campuses, but it's also about race and identity. And I hope that hearing a bit about my research, it will encourage you to do some research of your own about Penn State Altoona. I did a little detective work before I came, and I learned that your campus has about 4,000 undergraduates. Of those 4,000 undergraduates, 83% of you identify as white, while about 5.5% of you identify as black or African American. A bit more than 3% of you identify as Hispanic or Latino. Nearly 2% of you identify as Asian American. And 1.5% of you identify as multiracial. One-fifth of 1% 1 of you, fewer than 10 individuals on this campus, identify as Native American, or a member of a, a group original to the United States. Just over 3% of Ivy Park students were holdouts, refusing to answer the question. Um, and there are about 30 students, or 3 quarters of 1% of you, who are international students. Why are these statistics important? Because you will leave here and enter the work world, or graduate school, and it is likely that you will move to an area more diverse and more urban than Altoona. It's true that the Ivy Park campus is much more diverse than the city of Altoona. Indeed, I learned that Altoona is 96% white, another 2.5% are African American, and fewer than 1% of all other groups make up the final 1.5% of Altoona's population. But in every larger urban area of the country, including most suburbs, you will find greater racial and ethnic diversity. Nationally, African Americans make up about how much of the country? What percent? Anybody have a good guess? Yes! Woo! Okay. Latinos and Hispanics make up? Nine. Close? More? <laughs> Somebody else want to give it a try? Fifteen? Eight? Okay. Closer to the fifteen. About thirteen to fourteen. So just a little bit more now than African Americans. Um, let's see. So African Americans and Latinos together make up about 25% of the population. Asian Americans, Native Americans, and those who identify as multiracial make up about another 10% of the population. And census workers estimate that in another 40 years, 50% of the country will identify as people of color. Actually, as I was checking into the hotel, there was a census auditor there who's been sent up to look at the office of this area of the country because this year there's a census. So almost any place that you move, your coworkers are likely to be from a greater variety of backgrounds with a wider range of social identities than you experience here at Penn State Altoona. 
at the close of this talk, I will challenge you to do a couple of things to increase that aspect of your experience here that may help you to learn a little bit more about diversity. So just because you're here in a place that's less diverse than a lot of places isn't the final note. There's some things that you can do to make your experience here more rewarding and I think more intellectually vigorous as well. Understanding who we live and work with and the organizations that we live and work in as organizations and understanding some of the things that drive us and others will allow us to contribute toward achieving greater justice. I'm one of those uh, intellectuals who believes that the pursuit of knowledge should be for achieving justice. It also should be for the pursuit of knowledge itself, but for me those things are really closely aligned. The wonderful thing about scholarship is that it can bring us beyond ourselves. I started with the black student experience in my own research because that's who I was. That was my starting place. But I was really looking for it to expand my universe. And scholarship did that for me. You can learn things that you never expected to learn, both about yourself and others. And it can offer you a template for examining the situations of groups that are very distinct from the one with which you are most familiar. Let me say a few words about the title of my book, Acting Black. When I speak about acting black and performing race, I'm not really interested in discussions of student performance and what many people refer to as the achievement gap. In fact, I consider the focus on the academic performance gap between white and black students in particular to be a troubling distraction, encouraging a focus on the deficits of African American and Latino students in particular, rather than on their strengths. Indeed, it also shifts the problem to helping those students to catch up, rather than to looking at the ways in which many predominantly white institutions need to change and will benefit from doing so. For the most part, those persons who care about the so-called performance gap are not wringing their hands about the difference in test scores between Asian Americans and whites. And I think this is for at least two reasons. First, whites know that white privilege remains, even in the face of differential achievement. And second, whites also do not consider test score differences, in this case, to be indicative of white intellectual inferiority. I use the term acting for three reasons. First, I want to introduce my readership to the work of a great 20th century sociologist named Irving Goffman. He used the language of the theater as his primary metaphor for describing individual social action. In his 1959 book, The Presentation of Self in Everyday Life, he argued that each of us performs or acts out our identity. Contemporary scholars have added to this insight. Not only do we perform our identities regularly, but our identities change over time. And the ways that certain identities that are culturally proscribed are ritualistically performed under a level of social coercion that's usually invisible to us. So in other words, there are lots of aspects of our identities race, class, religion, but also being a brother or a son or a father or a boyfriend or a girlfriend. And that we, depending on where we are in life, may um, focus on some of those identities, uh, someone who pays a mortgage, <laughs> someone who does the grocery shopping or the laundry. Those may be a bigger focus in some times of our life more than other times. The second reason I use the term acting black in my title is because I'm in a bit of an exchange with the late great psychologist John Agbu, who posited that some black children were not succeeding in school because they did not want to be labeled acting white, or because they are opposing what they perceive to be white culture and white authority. Agbu was trying to understand a social dynamic that occurred in some schools but he did not look at families where black students achieve, nor did he look at schools where black students regularly succeed or are in the majority. The danger of his thesis is that educators and educational policy experts can treat his hypothesis as a theory. It quickly becomes a stereotype, and many teachers quickly forget that what they learned from Agbu was a hypothesis, not one of God's commandments. I want to remind those of you who are professors, but there are not that many in the room tonight, and those of you who are training to become teachers, and that might be more of you, or social workers, or coaches, or physicians, 
that for tens of thousands of black students each year, heading off to college is quite simply acting black, even if Penn State Altoona does not come close to the national representation. <coughs> and the third reason that I use the phrase acting is because I think it's useful to remember that all of us act out and perform our identities, racial and otherwise, every single day from the clothes that we put on, to the music we choose to listen to, to the kind of things we eat, we're constantly acting and making a statement about our identities to others. The study I conducted really has two parts. One focuses on the college experiences of African Americans, and the other part focuses on race. Let me tell you a bit about the college aspect of my study, and then I'll say a few words about the race aspect. I was an undergraduate student at a mostly white co-educational college in the mid-Atlantic region of the country, and I spent a semester at an almost entirely black women's college in the southeastern United States. With the acting black research, I was trying to understand my own experiences during college, which was an emotionally draining experience when it came to race issues, but really eye-opening when it came to issues of class, religion, sexual orientation, immigrant status and gender. In many ways, my college experience was the first time that I met a range of really different people, people from backgrounds really dramatically different from my own. And that was both um, nerve-wracking and exciting. But more than anything, it just expanded my own intellectual vision. I wanted to think in a critical and systematic way about the issues that had faced other black students on the post-civil rights era campus. So I decided to interview men and women who were alumni and had all had a chance to think about college from a distance. The oldest folks in my study began college in the mid-1960s, and the youngest of the individuals I interviewed graduated around 1990. I wanted to explore informal inequality. That is to say, inequality that is not sanctioned by law, but is reflected in everyday living. Legal segregation is a form of formal inequality, for example. What were some of the differences happening on historically white campuses compared to traditionally black ones? The experiences of my respondents are now recent history. And so I'd like to hear from some of you about any observations that you have of your current campus situation. I spoke with 60 men and women, half of whom attended Howard, an historically black university, and half of whom attended Northwestern, a predominantly white university. I supplemented my findings with observations from my own teaching experiences over the 15 years at four institutions from the start of the research until the book was published. It's important to keep in mind that I only systematically interviewed persons that had attended these two schools, but in many ways the schools function as archetypes. Let me summarize the major differences between the college experiences for the alumni I interviewed. I had assumed that all alumni I interviewed had made their choices to attend one or the other school because of ideas of racial commitment. I had this idea in my mind that if you chose to go to an historically black school, it's because somehow you were making a statement about your racial identity. Um, and that's what had freaked me out when I had gone, I'd gone to a predominantly white school and I didn't think it said anything about my commitment, but I had this weird thing in my head that this is, somehow had to do with people's commitment or the politics. Um, among the individuals with whom I spoke, that was not the case. There were those students who grew up in all white or all black settings who made the decision that they wanted to immerse themselves in a completely different environment. But most of my respondents said that financial aid package was their primary reason for making their final choice. So most students, like most students in the country, are thinking, where can I go, get the biggest bang for my buck, major in what I want to, not break my family's bank, and be able to leave college without tremendous loans. That was the driving force. And for me, there was a kind of relief in that. I thought, oh, oh, that's the reason that most people chose college. So, it didn't necessarily, there were a few who de definitely chose to look only at historically black or, or historically white colleges. Um, but really financial aid package was what was key for most of the people I spoke with. 
With few exceptions, Howard alumni raved about their school, even when they had not had a pleasant experience there. They were devoted to it. They defended it. They spoke about it with a passion and a highly significant touchstone in their development. Betsy, class of 1974, told me, it was exciting from the very first day, just seeing that many black people who were having a common goal there. At Howard, it seemed everybody was kind of there for the same reason, and that was exciting. The beautiful thing about Howard that I enjoyed so much is that the people were really more positive. Black people were more positive than I had ever experienced. And it was that they were there because of the dream or a vision, and they were about doing that. And if you didn't seem to fit into what they were doing, they didn't even bother with you about it. It wasn't a lot of cattiness or gossip or anything like that, because people were really busy trying to work on their own agenda, unquote. George, class of 1985, contradicts Betsy's claim that Howard had no cliques, but he does appreciate how students found inspiration and comfort. Howard, he told me, has its cliquish elements and everything, but at least people could find people who they wanted to hang around with. At the small New England college where I started and I transferred from, you hung around with the black students because you were black, and there were so few of you, you couldn't make a choice based on geographic distinctions or common interests or anything. It was like, well, you're black, so let's hang together." Unquote. The Howard alums in my study saw their alma mater as having contributed to their confidence in themselves as African Americans, as persons who could deal with a variety of others, and as having gained knowledge and appreciation of African and African American history that they don't think they otherwise would have had. There were four aspects of the historically black college experience that alums noted that I argue contributed to that overall, overall sense of devotion to and good feeling about the university. First, they talked about the opportunity to pursue four years of education without navigating, responding to, or metabolizing implicit and explicit racism. Second, Howard alums were grateful for the chance to be anonymous when and if they chose one simply did not stop stand out as a black student or a student of color. For many, this lack of surveillance was welcome after a high school or neighborhood experience of being under the spotlight. Third, several alums were able to develop, invent, rehearse, and cultivate aspects of their personalities that were not primarily racial. So in high school, if some of these students had gone to all white high schools, they had learned that they were the white clarinet player who also loved poetry. Uh, or excuse me, the black clarinet player who also loved poetry. And there was kind of no way to escape that string of adjectives. But at Howard, there were five other black clarinet players and you know seven other bassoon players, and that they didn't have black in front of the thing that distinguished them. Fourth, alums trusted that their Howard professors all had confidence in them. Keeping all of these positive things in mind, there were aspects of the Howard experience that emerged from most of my interviews that reveal the challenges with which the university continues to struggle. Alums complained of bureaucratic inefficiency in terms of housing and financial aid especially, negative attitudes of staff towards students and students towards staff, and tensions between students and people in the poor and working class neighborhood that surrounds the university. There was also the recognition that some graduate schools and some employers did not appreciate their education because it came from an historically black university. But this was not a preoccupation since Howard has high name recognition and a generally positive reputation nationally. The Northwestern alums were much more ambivalent. While a slim majority of the folks I spoke with would attend Northwestern again, it was because they were unequivocal that attendance there had boosted their careers. At the same time, they prefaced their answers to the question of whether they'd repeat the NU experience with phrases like, oh gosh, that's a tough one, or I don't know if a person should have to endure so much pain in college. 
And while my experience was probably more positive than negative, I don't think another choice would have been necessarily any better. Several Northwestern alums told me they would like to send their children to historically black schools because NU did not reinforce building a positive self-image for blacks, unquote. NU alums told rambling narratives about social and academic experiences that they found confusing and alienating. Probably the most commonly expressed memory of the NU alums in my study is the perception that black and white students rarely mixed socially or academically. With few exceptions, alums celebrate the friendships they made in the black community on campus. But most were surprised at the racial homogeneity of social groups. They wondered out loud to me whether the university's administrators and faculty could have helped to facilitate racial integration on campus. And they note the social pressures they exerted on each other to keep blacks in and whites out when they felt embattled. Faculty and staff mentors stand out more among NU alums than they do at Howard. I think this is because at the white university, this particular kind of relationship felt more necessary. There were lots of stories of navigating the murky waters of an environment where people talked about the institution as beyond racism. Several individuals I interviewed asked me questions like, well, I don't know if it was racist. What does it mean if a professor loses your final exam? If your advisor is uninterested in seeing you? If the white kid in front of you on registration day strikes up a conversation with the white kid to their left, but not with you? If you're never invited to pledge a non-black fraternity or sorority? If you find yourself on a dormitory hall after room draw with a dozen other black kids? How do you handle being the only black student in advanced calculus? How do you negotiate your high expectations of the few black faculty on campus? The one unequivocally positive note that almost all Northwestern alums sounded was the prestige that having gone to this highly selective, predominantly white university had for getting into graduate school and for their upward mobility <coughs> in the work world. Mary, who graduated in the class of 1977 uh, from Northwestern, told me that she works in management for a Fortune 500 company. And her boss, a white male, is just infatuated, quote, with my education. He tells people all the time about my Northwestern degree. It's really a feather in my hat, more so than I ever thought it would be. It's turned out that it's had a big effect on how well my career has gone since then. So that's really the most noteworthy thing about it for me. The big thing that is, it, that is, excuse me, is that it affects now, is how other people look at me and how wonderful they think it is, unquote. So that's just a snapshot of the experiences alums told me about. I'd be glad to offer any more uh, details during the question session. The second half of the book, as I mentioned, is really about race. And after I had asked and answered 20 to 30 questions about college, I turned off the tape recorder and thanked the alums for giving me their time. But most of my respondents began talking to me about what it meant to them to be black, how they dealt with their own and others' expectations of them as African Americans, how their sense of themselves had changed over time. Um, and even into adulthood beyond college, even sometimes from one conversation to the next, and what it meant for them to be seen as acting black in one setting and acting white in another. I began to recognize that the way sociologists have talked about race as something about which one is largely out of control, that circumscribes our life chances, our potential for healthfulness, our likelihood to go to prison, to achieve a certain amount of education, to have children at a certain age, to marry, and so forth. This way of looking at race obscures the way that we as individuals pull and push each other, contract and expand the meanings of our identities. And not just for African Americans, for every racial group, right? So if 
uh, social scientists are always talking about race in terms of how much education you have, or how many kids you're going to have, or where you're going to live, then what that can do is also play with our own minds. And we stop realizing the ways in which from one experience to another, we may contract and expand our own understanding of what it means to be white or Latino or Asian. right? And that we do that constantly. We change the way we talk. We bring up different topics. We revel in different foods. We listen to different music, depending on who we're with. So let me give you a couple of examples from my study. One alum of Northwestern remembers using the racial expectations of most whites in a conscious and explicit way. By mimicking expectations, she was able to undermine the construction of blackness to which she knew some white adults she met were loyal. Christine said to me, I remember one of my sorority sisters had a white roommate. This roommate was extremely rich. Her name was Sally, and Sally was flexible. And she realized the whole time while she had been growing up, her parents told her that blacks were this and blacks were that, the whole stereotypical nine yards. <coughs> So when she came to Northwestern, it was like she was smart. You know, she realized, you're just like me. Now, she had a car. You weren't supposed to have a car freshman year on campus, but her parents knew somebody in the administration at Northwestern, so she was able to have a car. Her mother and her sister and her father came up, so what we did is gave them the whole stereotypical black. And Sally pretended like she had assimilated so well to her black roommate that now she was like us. Her parents ran out of the room, and then she said, oh my gosh, so we had to run after them, grab them, and bring them back. And then finally, we became very good friends with her mom and dad, and we laugh about it to this day, unquote. So let me be clear, this is neither the very rare occurrence of passing of a white-looking black person pretending to be white, but it is the much more common situation of people who identify as black and one person and one white person as well, pretending to embody the stereotype of blackness in order to interrupt or undermine that stereotype. One of the things that I learned was that each school had an ideal type, a description of a student that all students were aware of or wished were there or feared was there or knew to be there and onto which students projected their anxiety. At Howard, this was the light-skinned, arrogant, and wealthy young woman. At Northwestern, this was the urban, working class, and dark-skinned, radical male student. While there are surely students who fit these descriptions throughout the last 30 years on each campus, their presence in the narratives of alumni, most of whom did not resemble these types, points to the fact that different challenges and anxieties face students who choose different kinds of schools. I encourage you to think about how Penn State Altoona is seen by the students who go here and by those who do not. What reputation did it have in your high school? Did people know about it? Do people confuse it with Penn State University Park or Penn State Abington or Penn State Brandywine? Do some people see it as a sports school or a party school, or a science and technology school, or a humanities school? What stereotypes of the students have you run into? How do you make sense of those for your own performance of identity? Let me go on to some of the implications from these findings, and I'll begin to wrap up. In the immediate two decades after the Civil Rights Act, Northwestern appeared to do everything right, an excellent job of recruiting black students compared to many other historically white colleges and universities. That said, the admission of students is not where any colleges or universities' responsibility ends. The black alumni with whom I spoke wished that college administrators and faculty had found a variety of ways to introduce students from different backgrounds to each other and to help them sustain those relationships with interracial study groups, clubs on campus that had goals of reaching out across difference, of being as supportive as possible when students wanted to celebrate multiculturalism or to understand the ignominious history of racial pluralism in this country. What does ignominious mean? Shameful, right? So we have this wonderful pluralism, multiculturalism in this country, but it has some shameful origins, 
right? And by that I just mean that uh, we started with a lot of slavery, we started with the um, deracination of American Indians, we started with bringing in indentured servants who were white. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of shamefulness to the beginning of what really has become our greatest strength. And so that's one of the things that the students, that the alums I talked to said. I really wanted to dig deeper in some of my courses. I wanted to have courses shown to me that would help me do that digging. And those weren't always clear, and all, they weren't always obvious. The alumni with whom I spoke, who went to the mostly white university, are glad to have made the good friends they did. But they expected more of college, and also expected that faculty and staff would be clearer about their role in modeling for students what a truly multiracial intellectual learning environment looked like. Making the campus community one that embraces diversity is not just a goal for students, but it's a goal for faculty. I mean, it should be a goal for faculty, and it should be a goal for staff. And between faculty, staff, and students, it really can't be restricted to one group or one, um, one particular constituency on campus. As Ruth Seidel reminds us in her book, Battling Bias, racist behavior on college campuses is not limited to students. And I would add that the problem is not just racism. And increasingly, it's very challenging to find explicit racist behavior. Most racism, sexism, and classism is subterranean. Um, it's in slights that people say, it's in ignorant comments, it's in things that are on the internet, it's in um, not treating people who are different as if they were real friends, right? And if you treat people as real friends, you get to know them first before asking them uh, questions about their backgrounds, right? So if you have a good friend and you know that friend has lost a parent, you don't decide that you're going to, um, you know, go deep into that friendship by starting there. You get to be friends with that person first, and then you find out about that, that, that traumatic event for them. Most people recognize that universities must educate students about the institution's relationship with and responsibility to the surrounding community. What many of us do not recognize is that in order for such a relationship to be both respectful of the agency of those in contact with, in relationship to, and financially dependent on the university, community organizations must be full partners, not treated as fortunate recipients of the university's largesse. And second, relations between a university and the surrounding town or city must be preceded by the work of consensus building, where explicit discussions take place among representatives from every facet of the university about its mission. So these discussions should focus on elitism, on classism, on, uh, on racism, and other relationships of privilege and oppression. I'm mentioning this because although my study was about blacks in college, the deeper issues have to do with how we all treat each other. And so that means how students interact with members of the community in terms of community service, how faculty treat staff, how staff treat students, all of that good stuff. And this is really time consuming and uncomfortable work, but it's never gratuitous, right? It's never just on the surface. It always has a deep, important meaning. And it's work that really must be undertaken by all members of the college community, including administrators and student government folks and dean of students and sports teams and faculty and janitors and secretaries and food service people and librarians, everybody. Why am I ending a talk about black students in college with this encouragement to make sure that all groups are listened to on the Ivy Park campus? Because this is both what is fair and it's crucial training for the skill of listening to and learning from others whose experience is not like yours when you leave college. Just because this campus environment is not currently the most diverse does not mean that you will be handicapped when you leave here. And just looking at the diversity in this room makes me sure of that. Advocate and work with admissions to bring more students of color and international students Start a club about bridging differences. Start a book group on the topic of diverse experiences and add a discussion section each semester. Start an annual film series about difference. Invite more speakers from diverse backgrounds. Take courses that broaden your horizons, 
even if they don't directly contribute to your major. Really get to know people who are different from yourself in terms of religion, race, class, region of the country, but get to know them as friends, not as individuals who owe you information about their group. Read a national newspaper at least once a week. Start a gospel choir, attend a local powwow, visit the Little Italy section of Altoona, and discover how immigrants who were Italian and German and Irish and so forth fared here. Those of us who are college professors and college administrators love to tell you to take advantage of all that college offers. And clearly, I'm no different. But I do want to challenge you to take advantage of the things that may not be transparent. Dig below the surface. Push yourself outside of your comfort zone. Because only then will you be prepared for the life you encounter when you leave Penn State Altoona. Good learning. Good luck. Not just acting black or white or brown or red or yellow, but acting human. Thank you. I'd be glad to take questions for a few minutes. At least until our pizza gets here. Yes. How do you think um, <coughs> the issue of colorblind? I think colorblindness plays a big role. Mm -hmm. I think that people no longer see that there are differences. I'm not saying that there are such great differences between um, different peoples, but culturally, right. um, or wherever the individual is from, regionally. Right. Um, I think that we just kind of, and I'm speaking generalizing as we, right. just kind of close our eyes to that and we don't um, embrace that there needs to be Right, right. That is such a good question, colorblindness. Colorblindness is the grand fiction, <laughs> absolute fiction. We are a tremendously color conscious society, tremendously so. And yet, we have this ideal of colorblindness. And I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, because what I appreciate is that the ideal of colorblindness comes out of a good place. Many people quote Martin Luther King Jr.'s uh, I Have a Dream speech as their evidence for why colorblindness is good. Um, but Martin Luther King Jr. actually wasn't talking about pretending not to see difference. right? He was talking about mutual respect even in the presence of difference. Even in the presence of difference. Um, one of the concepts that I love in sociology was one that was really generated by an Italian sociologist who spent uh, his last years in prison by the name of Antonio Gramsci. And to keep himself from going crazy while he was in prison, he was a political prisoner, he wrote, and he wrote, and he wrote, and he wrote, and he tried to describe what was going on with a modern industrialized society. Um, and uh, and he, he died before he got released from prison and his notebooks were published posthumously and they're called the prison notebooks. And in the prison notebooks, one of the concepts that Gramsci comes up with is hegemony. And he says in contemporary modern industrialized states, especially ones that have democratic tendencies, like ours does. I don't want to say ours is a full-fledged democracy. I think the United States has wonderful democratic tendencies, but the latest Supreme Court ruling um, makes me very nervous about whether individuals have more rights than multinational corporations. Um, one of the things he said was that there's no longer a small group of men sitting in a room saying, how can we control everybody, right? Or we own everybody like serfs or slaves. In fact, modern governance is done by coercion and consent. Right? So the majority of people consent to the way that they're governed. And they consent to it because they're also coerced into that. But that coercion is often uh, opaque. It's often not visible to them. And the reason it's not is because those people who uh, are in the positions of privilege and power also dominate the media. And the media is the largest, uh, the largest cultural force that gets people uh, their knowledge, right? And so if the media is your biggest way of getting knowledge, then, and if there is a small group of people controlling the media, then 
you, me, we're at a particular disadvantage, right? And so there's no accident that, uh, you know, we all like the same number one song, or we all like the same movie, or we all are wearing the same clothes. Um, that's not accidental, you would say. The more, the more serious thing is when we all start to um, kind of agree about the same politics, or there's not uh, an oppositional force. And he said, actually, there's always what he calls a counter-hegemonic force. There's always opposition. Um, this is a long way of saying that after the gains of the Civil Rights Movement, when there was formal, when formal inequality was made illegal, right? When uh, segregated schools and segregated housing was made illegal, one of the things that we didn't do was also move the culture forward to thinking about how to make informal equality, how to erode informal equality. So we have these great leaps forward in terms of legal changes, but we're still working on those informal um, aspects of the culture. And um, one, of, one of the ways that hegemony works for Gramsci is that it splits the opposition, and it takes in some of it, especially the rhetorical aspects of it, and says, this is who I am now. So, how can we have an African American president? How can we have an African American on the Supreme Court? How can we have um, African American presidents of Ivy League institutions? How can we have that and still African Americans are dramatically overrepresented among those who are poverty stricken? We can have Martin Luther King Day and we can have Katrina, right? Mm -hmm. At the same time. And Gramsci was saying, back in the first half of the 20th century, because hegemony takes on the rhetoric and it makes some substantive changes, but then it doesn't make others. One of the pieces of the rhetoric that got pulled in was colorblindness. <laughs> and that got held up as an ideal. <clears throat> Thank goodness, we've made it. The civil rights movement works. Now we can all just be colorblind and not look at color. Well, it's convenient to not look at color when we still have so far to go in terms of eradicating racism. It also is just wacky, right? And it makes some people feel crazy because some of us are pretty clear that we do see color. I mean, it's weird to say that I don't see color, but I do see gender, right? Everybody sees gender. And what it really is is a cultural invitation for us to not talk about it, to not talk about difference. So I want to say, we're not colorblind, we're color conscious. Color conscious is not synonymous with being racist. It's color conscious. <laughs> it's just seeing it like blonde hair and brown hair and different color eyes, right? And that if we move toward um, saying we're colorblind too quickly, then we take away from ourselves the possibility of really digging deep, figuring out our history, challenging contemporary racism, because we look a little bit crazy, because we're saying, yes, it's still happening, even though we're supposed to be colorblind. So um, that's a, an excellent question, and I think it's a really hard one, because I think for a lot of people, it comes out of a good place to say, to say their ideal is colorblindness. What they want to say is, I want to be in a place where I can mutually respect people who are different. What it too often means is, I don't want to deal with conflict, and really think about difference. So, I promise the next answer I give won't be so long. So somebody can give another question. Yes. Hi. About five, five or six years ago, I had a student in one of my courses who, uh, and I push a lot of diversity units in, in a course I advanced, but that he's a small group communication. Uh, one of the students actually sat in class, they're all sitting in a ring, and this blonde, blue-eyed, lovely young lady very, very delicately approached the issues that you're talking about when she said that she came from a suburb of a miniature town in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. The notion that there was a suburb of that town <laughs> other than a cow was a miracle. And so she came from that suburb and arrived here at Penn State Altoona. Her initial experience, she quite openly said in class, was one of terror because she had never been near or seen a live 
individual who was an individual of color, be it mm -hmm. African American or Hispanic mm -hmm. or any other color. She hadn't met anyone who was Protestant. She hadn't met anyone who was Jewish. Mm -hmm. She hadn't met any gays. She hadn't that she knew of. Of course, <laughs> of course. That she knew of. But I mean, it just, she was absolutely dropped into this pool at Penn State Altoona. Right. Of incredible diversity. The incredible diversity. Compared to her experience. Compared to her experience. And I, I immediately said to her, I love you very much because you felt the courage to share those those feelings. And that brought out a whole bunch of other stuff that was going on at the time. But when we think about Penn State Alton, we had international students here. We've had students from many different levels of diversity. When I was doing doctoral work up at UP, the uh, Native American program there was tremendous, nationally, nationally known and so on. So there were a whole series of experiences that people have had. The interesting thing is that we don't verbalize these things the way that young woman had the courage to do. And she really said, this is how I feel at the moment. Mm -hmm. And following that experience in the course, she felt a lot more comfortable in that room and began to be a lot more active because prior to that, she was just an isolated, literally encapsulated individual. Now that doesn't just happen with her. That happens with every segment that we can think of. In fact, I mean, I'm so glad you brought this up. In fact, the sociologist Charles Gallagher has argued that most of our experiences with people who are different from ourselves happens through television. Mm -hmm. yes. Ah! Yeah. <laughs> right? So most of our experience, a few of us, a few of us grow up in multi-racial neighborhoods, but there are a handful of them throughout the country. A few of us go to schools that really are multiracial, but most of us don't. So that's also this kind of burden of guilt that a lot of students feel like, ah, you know, I, I didn't know, and what I learned, I learned from television, and television is so not the place to learn about difference. Um, but it is the place that most of us do. So just knowing that can push us to uh, turn off the television um, and get to know each other. But to recognize that we all come from these different experiences and to have compassion for each other when we make those initial steps um, to try to bridge difference because it's not easy at all. But critical mass is crucial. You know, there, um, in any organization, when there are at least 15% of a subdominant group or a minority group, um, then things start to happen. Things start to change. So it may be that there are not 15% of one minority group here, but all minority groups together may be approaching 15%. And if they make al allies with each other, then that can begin to shift things on campus. So that's really important when you're a member of a subdominant or underrepresented group to make allies because that will really help to bring about change. And it also helps people just not to feel so isolated. And it's straight, I went to Susquehanna University a couple of years ago and um, they were less diverse than Penn State Altoona, quite a bit less diverse. And uh, I think they were about 96% white. And so all the students who had any kind of difference were bonding together. And what was interesting was that those students didn't think they had things in common with each other, ended up learning that there were parallels between that subdominant experience, regardless of whether it was racial or religious or sexual orientation or whatever. And I think that was a great experience for them. Any, one, uh, any other questions from a student? Thanks. Thanks for coming. Yeah. That's it. Okay, I must have given you a lot to mull over. <laughs> um, so I'd be glad to hang around and ask and answer any questions. You want one more? Okay, one more quick one. Well, no, no, no. It's about um, oppositional identity. Oh yeah. So. Oh. So some of you heard, it, and I'm going to make this five minutes, and then you can go. So she was asking about oppositional identity. And those of you who might have taken a psychology or education course might be familiar with that. I talked a little bit about John Ogbu, and he was the one who really came up with that phrase. And he was really interested in situations where he found black students talking about not wanting to push themselves harder because they'd be accused of acting black in their high schools. 
And that is true in certain circumstances, by all means. But what was interesting to me is to find that there are other social scientists who've taken that research further and found out, wow, you know, that's not true in all schools. So what's going on there? Um, and that there's some similar things happening with Latino students and even Asian students um, in terms of being labeled white or not white. Although Asian students don't get that same label quite as much because of the model minority stereotype of Asians to do well, right? Um, and in predominantly black schools, none of the kids who are doing well are accused of uh, or have anxiety about acting white because there's no white uh, group of students in that school. Thanks for coming. Drive carefully. So um, I think oppositional culture is an interesting one, and I think it can probably be generalized beyond schooling, that there are lots of different situations in which people find themselves resisting the authority. And it really doesn't have to do necessarily with wanting to act white or not act white. Although white scholars like to think it's all about being white. <laughs> I think sometimes it has to do with resisting the authority of the people in authority and saying, you don't have the answers all of the time. Or I'm getting some other information from my parents or from my neighborhood. So it's a, it was a really helpful concept when it came out. It just really needs to be expanded and complicated. I'm just wanting to figure ran for researchers who have done it basically in predominantly African American um, schooling systems where there like you said there is no measure. Right. Uh, I have one in my mind, just so see me afterwards and I'll tell you. You, you have one question? No. You're just putting your hand up. Okay, you just you just break my heart. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for coming.